Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Daily Thinker Podcast. I'm your host, Gusto. We got a special guest here today. Go by the name of Jordan Scott. Hey, man, listen. How you doing, Jordan, man? How you doing today? I'm here, brother. You here. I don't know why I got you on the show anyway, but we got him on the show. <laughs> Coronavirus. <laughs> uh, since Corona came, we had to get him on the show. But if you didn't know what this um, podcast was about, it's about sports, faith, and apologetics, all in one podcast. Now, tell me what the podcast you know they do that. You know another podcast like that? I don't know of one. I don't know of one either. So, welcome. So, let's see. What are we going to talk about today? Um, it's a I, lot I know I know. we're going to talk about today. I, I really want to ask him. <laughs> it's just... just with this coronavirus going on Come and all this madness, anxiety, stress. Absolutely. Mental health is rising. Yes. And it's getting serious. Yes, sir. Like, it's getting serious, getting scary out there. So what you think about that? Um, so I'm not a professional as far as mental health, but I do have experience with mental health. Um, I do know it's affected a lot of people. Um, I do know anxiety is rising in this time especially when people are, um, you know, just worried about what's next because it feels like it's all in the air. Right. You know what I'm saying? It feels like everything. You don't know what to expect. So I know there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. A lot of people who own businesses, I've been thinking about them. Um, like, if they don't have, like, an essential business. Right. You can be out of business right now. You can be out of business. And, you know, I know they're sending out. I know Trump. Uh, uh, sending out checks, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, sending out all the stimulus checks. They dropping these weeks off, y'all. Got yeah. y'all. So make sure to, you don't just spend it on those shoes now. Right. He trying to stimulate everybody, but that's going to run out. Gonna run uh, out. He's only sending like $1,200, but to a business owner, you know. How can that help? You still got to pay your employees. They still got to pay your employees. Employees still got to provide for their family. Still have to provide for their family. So <laughs> I know there's a lot of stress right now with everyone, um, but – I know that there are solutions to the mental health problem. Um, me personally, my personal experience with mental health, um, let's kind of dive right into it. So I started going to therapy last summer. Um, I had been promising my uh, girlfriend that I was going to go uh, because we had been having issues in our relationship. I've been promising her I was going to go. You know, I'm going to change. I'm going to go. I'm going to change. But it took her, which is, which is sad, but it took her – Yikes. Breaking up with me. Yeah. It took her breaking up with me to really like, okay, something's got to change. And um, she really, it, it really changed my life. Um, I am I mean, it doesn't feel good, you know, to be broken up with, especially with who I was and who I thought I was. Um, it didn't feel good, but I'm glad she did. So I started going to um, therapy last summer. Completely changed my life. Completely. Yeah. Um. I just feel like I'm a better person. I'm a lot more empathetic. I'm a lot more um, caring. Um, I'm still the same me. Um, so did, you were saying you went to therapy. Did you get any backlash from, like, people around you about going to therapy? Like, you're weak. Like, why are you going to therapy, bro? No, like, so. Or did you get encouragement? Like, man, that's what you need to do. So I feel like um, the mental health conversation uh, has been, like, rising especially with millennials and in the black community, black millennials specifically um, have been talking about like mental health a lot. And I know I had been like, I feel like I was kind of being hypocritical. I was like, Oh yeah, your mental health is, you know, important. You need to go. But of course with me, you know, I had a lot of narcissist, uh, narcissistic tendencies and narcissists do not see yeah. their problems. They do not see when they're the issue. They don't know how to apologize. Um, and so, no, I didn't receive a lot of backlash because a lot of people supported me. Um, however, as far as my parents went, um, they were like, oh, okay. Um, okay, sure. Yeah. But they didn't, they didn't have the, oh yeah, you should definitely do that right. reaction. You could tell that they were, they could, they were like, oh, okay, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm I hope ain't nothing really wrong with you, you know, because you know, that's how they, like, <laughs> that's, how, think. that's how we view it. When you see somebody go to therapy, like, there's something wrong with this dude. Like, it really, it's something wrong with him mentally. Like, right. you ain't just, like, just going through depression, like, yeah. no, it's something wrong with you. Right. Like, now they think it's, real. you should be like in uh, an asylum. Or right. Something. So, no, they, they just kind of like, you know, it was like, okay, well, we, su you know, we support you, but I don't know really why you're doing it. Right. Um, 
So I went there and I had um, the most amazing experience. Um, I was able to really address some of my trauma and issues, especially being a black man. Um, a lot of us get exposed sexually early. You know what I'm saying? Six and seven years old. A, a lot of us have had experiences even at that age. You know, it's mind blowing to, to, to really think that. And a lot of us are silent about it. You know what I'm saying? We don't really talk about it. We'd be like, yeah, I, I just, you know, you know, it was cool. She, she was older than me, but you know, whatever. I just, and they kind of breeze by it. They, some 13, 14 year old girl or boy or man, um, sexually assaulted them and it, it's assault and we don't call it that. Right. We don't, we do not call it that. We just like, yeah, I was just six, seven, whatever she told me, you know, she let me, you know, whatever, whatever. And that's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's not okay as an, as an adolescent to be exposed sexually so early because right, cause sex is more than just oh physical. It's, it's, it's mental. It's mental, it's spiritual, it's emotional. Right, because people who say it's just physical, I just wonder why do people have so many bad reactions after they have a bad experience with sex if it's just physical? If it's just physical, physical like, why are you so mad? Right. <laughs> <laughs> why are you so angry? Why can't y'all get along? You know, we we see, oh, man, we see so many families. Oh, my God, so many families get, you know, messed up and torn apart and, are just raggedy. Right. Not saying that I'm looking down on like, you should be like this, you should be here. But I'm just saying the whole situation is toxic, is unhealthy. And that's because the root of it was sex. Yeah. <laughs> the root of it was sex. You know, sometimes people have one night stands and now they got a baby with somebody that um, they barely even knew. They barely even knew. And nine times out of ten, don't even like. Right. You know what just I'm saying? Just trying to have, yeah, we, Limited sex to just fun, like let's experience like this is just fun when it's really not about fun. It's really it's not. not nothing fun about that. Yeah, and so, um, like I said, I know a lot of people have had those sexual assaults happen, especially black men that don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I talked about that. I talked about how it affected me, um, my mentality. It just affected so much stuff. My sexuality, my my thoughts, just were running rampant. I I mean, I was molested um, yeah. at, a, at an early age. And actually, it wasn't even till this year where I, I recognized, because you, like I say, I went to therapy last year. It wasn't even this to this year, but I recognized that um, I had been molested um, by two different people. Wow. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize what it was. Um, it was on my way home. Uh, from school, and of course, I, my mind, what you know, I grew up real, you know, like I feel like I was grew, up, I grew up sheltered. Yeah, um, I feel like you know, um, and my parents they had good reason because it's so much stuff going out on out here. You don't know what your children could get into, so I appreciate you know them trying to protect me a lot of times. But um, you know, like on my way home from uh, from school, you know, I wasn't really doing what everybody else was doing. Um, I could assume because that's what they talked about. You know, I did it. A lot of them were capping. Right, <laughs> lying. Like, lying. But some of the students did have those experiences because some of them ended up pregnant. You know, yeah. um, you know, our eighth grade, you know, we went to middle school together. So. Right. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it was a young lady on the bus. Uh, and this might sound weird to some people, but if that's not my mindset and I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it, you know, mm -hmm. then, you know, because me being what, like sixth grade, I was just kind of minding my own business. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially, and I wasn't really prepared or ready for it. Um, and so she, you know, you know, did what she did on the bus, even though, you know, of course you have natural body reactions. Yeah. But in that moment, I didn't necessarily consent to it. You know, and so I felt conflicted about it because I was like, I didn't really ask for this, but it was like, it feels, it feels natural. It feels natural. Good. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't necessarily consent to it. And that's what messed me up about it. You know, um, and so I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even have a recollection of that until, 
like this year, I was like, wow, that wasn't that wasn't consensual. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was. And it, it, she was probably a little bit older than me, but it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's still like it wasn't consensual. So I know there are a lot of black men that, you know, who don't deal with this type of stuff and don't realize the effects that it has on you and don't realize that you're an addict now because of your experiences. You know, whether you're an addict to sleeping, you know, with multiple partners or yeah. or, or pornography, which has been my experience, it's somewhere along the line, you got opened up too early and now you don't know how to control it. You know, so that's really been my experience. Wow, and back to that, um, that was... That was that was beautiful. <laughs> but back to that um counseling, it's kinda hard for a believer to go to counseling nowadays. Right. Because people are like, Why are you going to counseling? Yeah, like exactly. Jesus just gonna heal you. He gonna do this, he gonna do that. Don't go to counseling, man. You don't got no faith. You weak. So did you get any of that? Well, I know that's the stigma. Yeah, that is the stigma um, a lot. And I know that's my the attitude of my dad because when I talked to him about it, you know, he wasn't necessarily ostracizing me about it. But that was the rhetoric. That was right. the the language. You know, well, you know, we need to pray. You know, we make sure we pray. And although prayer is good, I believe that the devil uses our mental trauma to tempt us. I uses. I think he uses our traumas as a gateway to set up our addictions and our sins that we commit that we can't seem to stop doing. So I feel like if you were traumatized in one area. It, it, he uses that as a my a mental battle, like in your mind, to like set you up to always be struggling with this specific thing. Um, and if we don't go to see professionals, you're gonna be doing all this praying and not really tackling the issue right. because prayer isn't a bad thing. Prayer is a great thing. Prayer is the most powerful thing you can do as a believer. You still um, have to do those practical things. But you still have to do those practical things. Me doing all this praying and asking God, you know, for his will and do this, God, do this, God. I wasn't talking to somebody. Right. You still need to talk to somebody. I mean, Proverbs talk about this. Seek wise counsel. Seek wise counsel. Um, not only that, um, confession is good. And confession doesn't just mean um, that I'm just confessing the bad things that I did. Let's just confess. Let's just talk about those things that I've experienced. Right with somebody that's professional and that knows how to um that knows how to guide me through my thoughts right. the thoughts that hunt me haunt me all the time the thoughts that I try to keep to myself you need to be honest with somebody and a lot of times we can't even be explicitly honest with believers that right. be the whole problem it be the problem cuz it's, <laughs> it's not that Prayer is a bad thing or we just need to believe God, but we don't have believers that are really like explicit with us. Let's talk about it for real. Right. Let's talk about how you felt when this happened to you. Let's talk about what you did that traumatized you or what happened to you that really traumatized you because we're so we're so concerned about what people think about us. And even this year there's been a journey for me. Um you know, I heard the quote from someone I um, I was watching The Breakfast Club. I love The Breakfast Club. Um, and Charlemagne was talking about this book that he had read. And I, and I need to find that book. It was talking about black mental health. Um, and she said, the, the author, I can't even remember her name, but she said we have to be willing to let go of who we want people to think we are. Right. And that's been a journey for me because it's scary. It but is. It, it can be scary. Because who people know you as is what connects you to your money, your reputation, your, you know, your whole life is based on who people think you are, you know? Um, and I, I'm just getting to the point where I'm, I'm willing to let go of who people think I am and just willing to be myself because keeping up that appearance, I wasn't allowing, allowing grace to be grace. Right. Um, and grace allows me to make mistakes. That person that y'all saw or see that you want me to be, don't make mistakes. Right. And a lot of times people have a lot of pride and they want people to think highly of them. They want people to think the best of them. They don't want th people to see their mistakes and their shortcomings. Um, 
But that's pride, though. And God opposes the proud yeah. and extends <laughs> grace to the humble. So I had to humble myself up out of that, that character that I created, you know. And can't that, like, mess with your mental health? Like, you trying to keep this image Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you can't uphold to it. You can't uphold to it. And then it's, it, it, it even goes against the word because uh, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But we got a lot of du- double-minded Christians because once they leave church, they somebody totally different. Yeah. Or when the lights go down. Or when you by yourself, I ain't got time for that. I want y'all to know who I am at church is the same person I am. At, and that's the one with the mistakes. Right. I'm not going to try to sit up there and put on this, this show because I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe in Jesus. I want you to believe that Jesus is my source. I want you to believe that without him, I can't do nothing. Right, because we be trying to make ourselves the savior. Everybody look at us like we the savior. Man. Like, man, he or she, she got it together. They man. got it, he together, got it together, man. man. I, if I right. know I can look at them and I'm encouraged. Right. And we like that. We like that yeah. gas. We like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, we love we love when people pat us on the back, man. I love you. Look at your relationship with God. And I look. If you only knew. Right. What's really going on. <laughs> What's really going on. Let's be for real. Let's stop playing. Because that's the reason why the saints can't reach the world. It's because they're not being for real about it. They not being for real. Jesus was for real about his like like straight up, straight literally. Forward. The reason why Jesus can intercede for us is because he experienced the very things we experience. Jesus is so good because he's relatable. He literally experienced betrayal. People have had friends that turned their backs on them for money. For money. For money. Judas. People have stole, people stole from Jesus. People lied on Jesus. You've had people that lied on you. You've had people that talked about you. For what? Right. You were innocent. You've had people that, that, that like done wrong things to you. And this happened to Jesus. This is why we can relate to him. But he never sinned. Right. He and never sinned. Man, but he suffered as if he did. He did. But you be seeing some of that. A little bit of that I be seeing. Like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm trying to be relatable. So that's why I'm doing this or doing that. And then it end up being sin. It end up being <laughs> like. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Which is really crazy. Yes. Absolutely. The key is being transparent. Not trying to be, you know, let me let me try to water down what I'm saying. Right. No, the key is being transparent. Jesus was transparent about what was going on with him. Jesus wept. He could cry. Jesus experienced things. You know, we think we just got to be so strong. Right. No. He cares about our mental health, too. He cares. He cares about he our mental cares health. I think it's extremely important to him about our mental health. Right. Bro, it's so important that that's the very thing that the enemy attacks is your mind. Yeah, right. He attacks your mind. Man, every time. We were literally, and what's crazy is we just had this, our Bible study last night, you know, just Ed Randall. I was like, bro, bro, let's, let's, let's just have Bible study. Yeah. Jesus experienced being tempted in the wilderness thrice. And the very thing, every time, every, what's so crazy is that every time the devil addressed Jesus, he said, if you be the son of God, God. he yeah. questioned who he was. He questioned who this man was. And that that's the whole thing with mental health. If Jesus didn't have strong mental health, he would have been weak and he would he wouldn't have succeeded. He wouldn't no. He couldn't know where he could be the Messiah if his his mental was weak. Because like, he literally, impossible. there's no way. No way. Jesus had strong mental health gain. He did. Period. To resist your enemies. To resist your own self. Because right. the devil can sound like you sometimes. He can. To even resist yourself is hard. And that's the whole thing with mental health is that being able to be disciplined in your mind enough to carry out the plan and purpose that God has for you. And if your mental health isn't strong, you're not reaching that. You're not reaching that at all. You're not reaching it. You're not reaching it to its maximum. Jesus only needed three years because his mental health was so clear and his mind was so strong. He literally fulfilled everything that he needed to do in three years. It's taken us 60 and 70 years <laughs> to finish one the, day. The, the work, <laughs> just one of the works that God has, one of the talents that right. he gave us. It's taken us 60 and 70 years. And Jesus, being the beast that he was, literally, th- the man was so cold. He ain't need but three years. Right, three. He was done. To do all that, to change the world in three years. This man changed literally. the world in three years. You mean to tell the me? The face of history in three years. And he was human, period. Yeah. He was human. He was hungry. He needed to take a bath. He He had to work for money. So 
Come on, he bro. was he was just like us. Come on, bro. In the same capacity. So if he was strong, his mental health. I know people are gonna say, oh, he was God in the flesh. No, though. that's why his mental no. was strong. No. no, he still had human. He still was human. He still was human. If so he, he was, still had to deal with mental health, because you can't tempt God. No, nope. you can't tempt God, but you can tempt a person. Yeah. The reason why Satan stepped to Jesus in the first place because he was human. Let's let's stop trying to play right. like you know. Well, Jesus was God. You know, he was God manifesting in flesh. Yeah. This is true. He embodied who God w- would have been if he was a, if if he was a person, but he was still a person. Right at the end of the day, he's still a man. That man still cried. That man cried. And speaking of crying, like when I went to therapy, I had never cried so much in my life within this short span of time. Man, I was crying every day. I was crying every day, um, just facing those monsters. And those skeletons in my closet. Oh, my God. I had never cried so much in my life. And it was so healthy. Right. And crying is healthy. It gives you this type of freedom. I can't explain it. It's just like when you when you got whooped when you were little. Yeah. When you, when you, before, you, like, you, you up all night. Your mama come in there. Your dad come in there. I don't know. This is what I experienced. And they're going to whoop they gonna whoop you to sleep. And you're going to cry. You're going to have the best sleep of your life. <laughs> what you going to do at the end with Demo? <laughs> You go yeah. fall asleep. Yeah, fall asleep. <laughs> that last little snip. That last little snip. You're going to be knocked out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's what I was experiencing. I was experiencing my emotions getting whooped. Um, whooped into shape, really, because I was emotionally weak, emotionally immature. Um, I didn't know how to empathize because I didn't have any empathy for myself. I didn't know how to really face those things that really hurt me. As a young child, you know, those experiences that I just kind of swallowed and kept to myself and never really cried about it. I'm here to tell anybody if whatever you experienced, if you have not dealt with it, it's still there. Yeah, It is still there. It's still stinking. It's still on the inside. It's still rotting. And you can ignore it. All day, but it'll just get worse. Yeah. Even if so, for the people who can't get to professionals, like mm-hmm. just talking to a friend. Oh, absolutely. Would be beneficial. It is. Um, But you have to be willing to really be transparent. It has to be somebody you can really trust. Um, You have to think about the relationship that you have with that person. Can I really be open and honest with these people? Um, and I would say that what happened with me was I wasn't really been, I wasn't able to really be transparent with, with people that were close to me until I saw a professional. Um, and I know, like I said, I know it's hard for some people to get to a professional, but there's a way you can, they have hotlines that you can call for free. Um, if you're a student, they have mental health and, you know, we go to Jackson state, so they have the Latasha Norman center, um, for that. But I would say go after your mental health relentlessly and pray about it. Pray about you getting help for it. I believe God will send you help if you really want it. If you really want it, yeah. If you really want it, I believe that you can get help about it because this thing ain't no joke. Right. It's serious. Like I I feel everybody deal with some type of mental struggle. Even throughout the years growing up, they put a, a stigma up on people with mental illness. Like, mental illness was just, like, a bad thing. Like, you were dumb. You should be in asylum. You should be really locked up if you yeah. got any mental illness. But everybody has some type of mental illness. Absolutely. You might not just be, you might not be diagnosed with it. Yes. But you deal with something mentally. Those people that end up in the asylums, it started somewhere, though. Yeah. Small. And they ignored it. Yeah. And the mind can only take so much. It's so sad. The mind can only take so much trauma, and these people are only products of their experience. They're not crazy. They weren't born crazy. Right. These people had so much stuff that happened to them and so much terrible things that people ignored. Even parents, people that cared about them, ignored that happened to them that literally their mind couldn't take, take it anymore. It's like loading loading a, a, a horse just 
you know, just putting stuff on them and putting stuff on them. Eventually, that horse is going to either kick back, like a lot of people do when they get in important places. S- stuff starts coming at them. Even the, the smallest, slightest criticism, they start to kick back. Yeah. And they don't know how to uh, uh, coexist with people, with their friends or with their coworkers or things that's, that's happening to them. And they can see themselves being at this point, at this high level, but their mental health is literally blocking them from being the best that they can be. So the stuff that's weighing on them is they're going to either kick back at first, but if they're backed into a corner and people are just throwing stuff on them and throwing stuff on the horse, think about the horse. Eventually that horse is going to break. Them legs gonna break, and, or or the horse is just gonna willingly get down, right? And eventually, and if they stay there long enough, they may not be able to get back up. And that's what happens to those people who wind up in those places. And people think it's beyond them. Oh, I ain't that crazy. I ain't gonna get to that. Right. But the mind is a tricky thing, and you don't want to get to that place where you're so bogged down by just. The weight of the world, just things that happen to you and you get to a place where you don't know how to get out. That's why people enter into deep depressions right. because they literally had so much happen to them right. that they kept bottled up inside. Right. And depression don't mean that you're crazy. Depression is just a part of this world. That's I think just every, a part of it. The world is, the world is messed up. It's messed up. It, you're going to be depressed. You're it, going to be. It's just going to happen. That don't mean you, you mentally... See, when I think about mental illness, I, when people frame it like that, I think of someone who probably can't think for themselves, like mm-hmm. probably like born like that, but like depression, stuff like that. That's anxiety, all mental illness. That, illness. That's, that's mental illness, but mm-hmm. I don't look at it as like, some people look at it the capacity like these people, they not okay because they deal with mm-hmm. anxiety. But those people depression. were okay at one point. Yeah. They were okay. Fine. But I feel like depression and anxiety are just a part of this world, just what the world has to offer, because the world is depressing. It is. Stuff it die. Be. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> stuff go wrong. You can't control everything that's you happening can't. around you, you like can't. even with this virus. Yep. Like, you can't, control, you can't control, it. control it. And that's one of the things. That's one of the things I learned with my mental health experience is that I humble myself to someone greater than me. And the thing is, a lot of times our pride will tell us that we can handle it, that we can tackle it, and we just kind of shove it to the back of our mind, when in actuality, you literally cannot take it. And so you have to give it away in order for it to really be healed and fixed. Mm -hmm. There's no way, absolutely no way, that your mind can handle everything that happened to you in your childhood, Every single thing that happened to you and your child and the world is so messed up is that you have children who deal with so much because I've worked with children you know for a long time (laughs) and me being just as young as I am I worked with kids for a minute Uh, I started working with kids when I was like 14 14 15 I'm 24 now so (laughs) I'm an OG to the game you know what I'm saying man but literally there's so much that can happen to children, especially in the black community. Right. Um, a lot of them come hungry or even if they're, you know, that's just one mental blockage that they have. That's why they're not excelling. Um, somebody in their household might be on drugs. may not be the mom, but they see somebody um, abusing drugs. That's trauma. They see um, mom having an unstable living situation and she has to depend on you know they see inconsistencies right and that's just normal to them or something ex- extreme as being in a domestic violence situation and even if you don't see it if you hear it or if you just see mama with a with a bruise on her that's trauma it is and it's in you and you need to deal with it and cry about it and realize the injustice that happened to you otherwise you're going to, at s- somewhere or another, you're not going to be able to function, whether it's keeping a job, keeping a, a healthy relationship, being able to be a parent, being a, even being able to, and, and this is what's so sad about the church, is that we judge people so much, and we don't know what they're going through. Right. Everybody can't sit in church service. Everybody right. can't sit in it. 
Number one, because everybody ain't got the focus for it. Literally, True. I've been through so much that all these happy people, all these people that's acting like they got it all together. And I got some real problems. I got here. real problems. What you talking yeah. about? Jesus yeah. going to save me. Nigga, literally my light's going to get cut off. <laughs> right. What are you going to tell them? Right. My mama can't put no food on the table. Can't right put now. no food so. on the table. I just use the N word, but listen, it is yeah. what it is. Like yeah. this is this is real talk. This is what's really going on with people, and people so quick to look at what they got on, or right. the way they walk, or the way they dress. You know, they hair like, oh my goodness. Come on, are you serious? It's These really people need to see the love of Christ, right. sacrificial love of Christ, right. and it ain't even like you just got to make a big sacrifice. All you got to do is ask them what's going on. No. God, talk to them. Talk to these people. Stop being so judgmental. Right. Stop looking at people funny and for where they are. That's the main people we should be going after anyway. Come on. All the poor. The ones the who poor, need help. The wounded. The wounded. Because I don't care what nobody say. Poor leads to mental Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. Everybody knows that. When you're in poverty. Poverty, it leads to deep mental issues. Deep. Mental and issues. so when the poor come into church and we say, oh, sit in the back. Oh, you can't come are in because you, you got a hat on. Like, that ain't Jesus. Like what type of what type of mess is that? They need to be that at type the of front, sitting by the pastor, the, right? So they can feel all the glory and the anointing that's coming off that pulpit. If you got some, right? Because even the Bible says you can speak with tongues and you can prophesy, you can do all that stuff. But if you don't have love, and love is literally caring for people who don't have. Nothing. We so worried about our attendance. We right. so worried about our numbers. We so worried about our darn, like how the church looks. We so worried about the praise team and the this and then and that and the lights and all this stuff. And we've forgotten who it's really about. It's about these poor people that are right. hungry. It's about these widows and these orphans. Right. Now, coronavirus that came around. Now you ain't got <laughs> nobody at your church. Now, now what you gonna do? Now what you gonna do? Ain't, can't but 10 of y'all coming in. I know some of y'all violating because y'all want to still have a nice life. Yeah. But can't but 10 people go in there. It don't matter. Everybody on the play, same level playing field. And we were talking about this last night. What if every church in Jackson, Mississippi adopted two homeless people? Right. Into we would church. eradicate the, the entire. Homeless people. How many, like. how many churches were, did you say were in there last I night? I think it's like 750. 80 something. It might be more than that because you know them back door church, them shotgun yes. churches too. You know, they got churches yes. too, but they might Store not be accounted for. Churches. Right. It's churches everywhere. It's churches literally on the same block. It's like three of them. Right. Like by Jackson State, <laughs> bro. It's like 10 churches. It's literally 10, churches. 10. And it's so many homeless people downtown. Right. And it don't be that many. Literally, we've had those interactions with homeless people. It be the same ones. It do. And I'm talking to myself too because I got to get on the good foot. I'm not just throwing stones at from from a glass house because you can throw them at mine, and literally you would it would break. So I'm right. not just throwing shade on the church, you know, because the church is great. I love the church. The church is where awesome. people where people come to get fed. Right. But we gotta step up. What mm -hmm. if we adopted at least two homeless people? We would eradicate homelessness yes. if we really right because it would be a domino.